Welcome to reInvent and the reInvent the Humanities to Change the World series, which is done in partnership with Georgetown University. I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent, and I'm going to be conducting the interview today. Today we've got John Markoff, um, who, from my point of view, is kind of the dean of technology, writers, reporters, uh, coming out of Silicon Valley. He has been a technology and science writer for the New York Times since 1988. And certainly for the last couple of decades, it's been kind of the authoritative voice on really all the big technology stories dealing with the big trends or breakthroughs as opposed to kind of company news and things like that. Uh, he's also an author of several books, two of which are very pertinent to this series on the humanities. Um, uh, one is uh, What the Dormouse Said, uh, and actually the subtitle being uh, How the 60s Counterculture Shaped the Personal Computer Industry. Uh, and that was a few years back, but it's very relevant to what's going on here today. But the one that we're really going to be talking about the most is his current book, which is uh, uh, Machines of Love and Grace. He also has these cryptic kind of titles with the subtitle being The Quest for Common Ground Between Humans and Robots. It's all about AI and robotics, very relevant to this theme today. So, John, thanks for uh, being here with us today. It's great to be here. Good morning. Um, now, here, re I read the book, love the book. But for a general audience who may not have read the book, um, why don't you just kind of set the stage a little bit on the current state of artificial intelligence and where it could be going in the next five or ten years? There's a lot of hype about uh, where it is and could surpass humans, and there's others that are kind of debunking it. Just give your kind of sober assessment or your, your, your realistic assessment of where we're at and where we could be going in, in the short term here on AI, and we'll talk a little bit about robotics in a minute here. Sure. I'd be, I'd be glad to. I mean, one of the things that's important to do is, is pick apart a couple of threads, and one of the threads is these wonderful movies that are out there, like the movie Her, or Terminator's uh, movies, or um, um, uh, 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 Ex Machina, um, Chappie. Uh, you know, so those movies sort of frame our perception of what machines can do. And then there's the actual ground truth of what machines are actually doing today and what they might be able to do over the next half day and uh, the next half decade. I tend to have a broad definition of what a robot is. Um, so a robot is not only a physically embodied machine that carries out all kinds of operations. Uh, it can be a robot arm, for example. Uh, also, Siri, I consider these disembodied uh, conversational agents to be robots, too. And, uh, you know, what's remarkable about this field, uh, going back into the 1950s where the term artificial intelligence was coined, is it's tended to overpromise uh, with great regularity uh, and, and until now un underdeliver. And so there have been kind of promises of thinking machines, uh, machines that are self-aware uh, or machines that are, self are conscious in a human sense have been predicted for a long, long time. And the reality is we're very far away from that level of uh, machine or human-like intelligence. Uh, there is, however, this idea of machine intelligence, of artificial intelligence or synthetic intelligence, and that is designing uh, hardware and software systems that do things that humans do. Um, they might see and be able to recognize objects, or they might be able to understand speech or, or speak themselves. And uh, what's really remarkable and what uh, sort of brought me as a reporter over the last decade into this field is that there has been rapid acceleration finally after years of sort of uh, false starts. The field of AI is making rapid progress. And uh, you can see it um, in the fact that we can now converse with machines easily like Siri. Siri tends to understand more and more of what we say to them. And then, um, you know, the machine vision technologies are sort of coming into everyday use uh, in places like self-driving cars. I now have a 2015 car that pretty reliably recognizes pedestrians and bicyclists. And that's really quite startling that that's a consumer level uh, product uh, that you know you can put anywhere in, in the things that surround us. And so um, it's, been, it's been really quite remarkable to watch the recent progress in the, in the, in the field in very narrow, what I think of as narrow domains, um, the ability to recognize handwriting character, uh, characters. Uh, the ability to recognize objects in a scene, uh, you know, the ability to under understand speech. There you can see that these machines are doing quite well at, at, at an increasingly rapid rate, and the progress is continuing. And so that brings you to the 
all of those discussions that we're having now because there's a new anxiety about the impact of automation and will these jo will these machines uh, will these systems take jobs and th that's where we are today. It's a good little intro. Um, why though, just just to kind of before we kind of leave it, why did it all of a sudden break open in the last kind of decade here? I mean, is it a function of Moore's law and the power of computer chips? Uh, and, and, and with that in mind, like where that's going, or or was it just Tell, tell me why now, and, and why should we be thinking it's going to accelerate the next ten years here? Yeah, it's it, that's a, that's a, a wonderful sort of way to to, to frame where we are. Um, uh, so it's a it's not one thing. I mean, there certainly is the acceleration of computing power, uh, in, increasing power, and falling cost has made technologies that didn't work uh, work much more effectively. So anytime you get an order of magnitude drop in the cost of some uh, computing function or some sensor. Uh, you get new things. And the, the classic one that I think people can easily see is this technology called structured light. It's a sensor technology that came first with the Xbox. And um, basically, it gives you the equivalent of machine vision at very low cost. And so machine vision, like five years ago, even would cost $10,000. And all of a sudden, now machine vision costs less than $100. And when you get those kinds of changes, then you can do new things. And so that's one area. The other area is these uh, technologies that are generally referred to as neural nets. Um, it's a model for pattern recognition that is based on the idea of what biological neurons do. Um, as they uh, were able to scale up the amount of data that they could feed to these neural nets, all of a sudden they became much more effective. And what seemingly, seemingly overnight, you know, between sort of 2010 and now, um, the, the rate of progress has been dramatic, and that has basically had an impact on vision and speech. And there, so you get the sense of this rapid incre uh, increase in performance, and the internet is a big part of that. So for the first time, it was very easy to put together big data sets in terms of lots and lots of spoken utterances or in terms of you know, millions of objects to recognize. And, and that created kind of a, a sense of like you, you turned the switch and it gave the appearance that all of a sudden you had this great acceleration. Interesting. Um, now, looking ahead, because a lot of the fear is kind of, oh my God, what's right on the horizon. One thing that's actually counter to this, which I've actually seen you comment on, I think it was in the edge, um, is essentially this in, in, inexorable Moore's Law that everyone's been counting on for the last 30 or 40 years. But you've actually started to question whether, in fact, that's going to continue. And if so, I was just wondering how that might screw up some of the trajectories yeah. of, the, uh, of, of, of how far this could go and how fast. And, uh, could you talk a little bit about yeah. the Moore's yeah, Law flowing phenomenon? Yeah, there's a rich debate about pace, basically, and then, so the Valley, uh, Silicon Valley, as a culture, worships well, the way I describe it. They worship at the Church of Moore's Law. Um, we've lived off of this exponential increase in computer performance for decades, and the, the the way to think of it is not just that things get faster, but that they get faster, faster, and more importantly, I think, is that they get cheaper, faster. So it's the rate of change as opposed to just change. And I, you know. I, I grew up in Palo Alto. I'm a child of Moore's Law, and you begin to think of that as a given. And in fact, it has been a given for, for decades. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that is meant that as you turn this crank, you kind of get this free ride. And so we've seen over, you know, going back into the 1970s, at routine intervals, new industries arise because of, of new costs, uh, this new cost structure. So you go from mini computers to personal computer to laptop computers to all kinds of consumer gadgets, and it's all basically a free ride that's driven by cost. So here we are, and just a couple of months ago, Intel, after having this corporate strategy that they called TikTok, um, one generation you would create a new computer architecture, and the next generation you would shrink it, and you'd get this cost reduction. So they've been on a TikTok sort of uh, 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 curve, cost curve, for decades. And they just missed for the first time. It's now tick tock tock, And that was really quite dramatic. So they were not able to get from, uh, from you know, one generation to the next generation. I think they missed on 10 nanometers. And that's the minimal feature size in the piece of silicon. But there, that's just one example of this plateauing of, of, of Moore's Law that we've been able to count on. The other classic one is for most of the industry right now, the cost of transistors, the per transistor cost, and you know, now we have silicon pieces of silicon that have billions of transistors, so the individual cost of a transistor is pretty low, but it's no longer getting faster with each generation. 
So if you don't get this driving uh, economic effect of lower cost, what's the reason to go to the next generation? So that's an issue. There's also, in 2006, almost a decade ago, one of the corollaries to Moore's Law was something called Denard scaling. And Denard scaling um, was this uh, basically kind of exponential rise of the clock speed, the rate at which the transistors turned on and off, and that's plateaued for a decade. So then finally, you have this other wonderful effect that's called dark silicon, which I love as a term. And in the microprocessor that's in your smartphone, there's actually an incredible uh, amount of software that, it, and, and its function is basically to uh, turn on and off different blocks on the, Microsoft, uh, on the microprocessor because if they were all on at the same time, the microprocessor would melt. And so if you can't use all the transistors, then it's not as effective. And so all of things, these things are conspiring basically to cause a plateau and that sort of relentless acceleration is not happening right now. And you know, so just one more anecdote. Uh, I was at the Stanford Affiliates meeting in the spring, uh, which is where all the sort of semiconductor partners who invest in uh, uh, the semiconductor, who invest in Stanford's uh, sort of R&D um, <clears throat> were there meeting and they were talking about these, these effects. Um, and uh, at the very end, I met this young Harvard computer architect, a guy by the name of David Brooks, and he was just giddy uh, because of this. And he said, you know, now it's our turn. Now the way we're going to make progress is through human cre creativity, which I think is really quite, uh, you know, it's not like saying things are over, but creativity and progress are not free. They'll come episodically, and that's where I think we are now. So that, and that's the that's the context for which this AI development will take 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 place. Well, well, so just to put it to fuse it back to the direct thing about AI and um, and robotics, is is would this undermine the kind of Ray Kurzweilian kind of um, kind of theory and that whole crew that that if it if it really is plateauing, then essentially the the levels of uh, scary artificial AI where they're kind of become our masters thing does it kind of gets undermined at the same time. Would you say well, that? Well, you have to remember yes, and so this, there's this term called the singularity, and uh, it you know it was it was it was popularized by a science fiction writer and computer scientist Werner Vinge some time ago, who basically looked at the curves and said if it goes on like this, there'll be this explosion of machine intelligence and they will be more intelligent than we are in holy mackerel, what will happen then? And Kurzweil has sort of enumerated that in great detail in, in, uh, in his book on the singularity. And, you know, it's just, I mean, it's wonderful science fiction, it's not science. I mean, they are making the assumption that it's, and at some point these machines will learn on their own and then they will learn faster. And the fact is that the machines, uh, these programs are not learning on their, you know, learning in a human sense of understanding a concept uh, is not happening yet in that, in that world. And so maybe, maybe at some point it will. I can't say no, but I see no evidence. And most of the computer scientists who are serious practitioners in the field dismiss that model of, uh, of improvement, which is not to say that these machines uh, will not have a huge impact on us. Uh, you know, one of the... The, the benchmarks uh, in the past was something called the Turing test, and the, the Turing test, you know, was this notion that you could design a computer program, you could hide it behind a wall, and if you could have a conversation with it for an extended length of time, and you couldn't tell whether you were talking to a human or a machine, then you could say that that machine, according according to Turing, was was intelligent. And you know, I, I've always thought that that was an incredible misnomer. My perspective on the Turing test is it's a test of human gullibility. The Turing test is about us, not about the machines, and it turns out that we are a very easy species to fool. And, you know, some of us want to be fooled, but, you know, these, are, these things are really fun, and, uh, but I don't think it says anything about the notion of what's happening inside the machine, and does it compare in any way to what's happening inside a biological system. Um, the reality is we have no idea yet what consciousness is. We have some theories, but if we don't know what consciousness is, there's no way we can code it and build, build it into a machine. And then there's also very little evidence that that, I mean, perhaps there is this sort of belief that out of scale you get spontaneous behavior, and maybe one of those spontaneous behaviors could be consciousness. I, I can't say that that's impossible. I just see very little evidence of that happening. Anytime okay, soon. So, so if we can set aside the worry of 
robot overlords. Uh, and let's just say you, you debunk that right now for, for this moment. But th that said, is your book is filled with a lot of concern about uh, displacement in the economy uh, and the kinds of jobs that, in fact, uh, smart machines, let's, you know, not maybe as smart as us or smarter than us, let's say, but still very smart machines would be able to take an increasing amount of what is now human labor, including very you know professional labor and things like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, in the very yeah. near term, we're watching that kind of play out here very shortly? Yeah, and so you know, I'm just one voice in a, a, a real interesting conversation. I mean, American society seems at decade-long intervals to go through these periods of anxiety about the impact of auto automation. We're clearly in that right now. My book is just one. I mean, there are probably a half dozen books that are all discussing the impact of. Um, of this rapid acceleration on the on the workforce, and I, I have to say, first, you know, uh, my book was finished uh, almost a year ago. There's a long lag time between when books, uh, you know, are, are are written and when they come out. It's a, it's an old media, and and my uh, my thinking has evolved a lot even since I wrote the book. And I was much more cautious than some of the other books on this impact. And you know, there there's uh, uh, there's uh, Brindelson and McAfee's The Race Against the Machine and the Second Machine Age. There's Martin Ford's um, uh, The Rise of the Robots and Lights in the Tunnel. Uh, Jerry Kaplan, Machines Not Need Not Apply. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and several others. Jan Lanier uh, has a book, I think, um, who, who Will Control the Future. And uh, what, what, where I come out, I mean, first of all, this is sort of a confession. I was one of the people who sort of started this new concern. I, I wrote some articles beginning in 2010 about the impact um, of these technologies on skilled white-collar work, which we were seeing for the first time then. And particularly, it was when I began to notice that $35 an hour paralegals and $400 an hour attorneys were being displaced by programs that could do a demonstra demonstrably better job of reading legal documents. So that was quite dramatic. Uh, and in fact, it has had an impact on the on the uh, uh, on the on the legal profession, which, which is really quite striking. Um, that said, I've really come all the way over. Um, and the other thing I have to say is, this is like uh, for a, a newspaper reporter, this is the absolute best thing that can possibly happen because you have this wonderful spectrum of opinion. On the one side, you have the International Federation of Robotics that argues that the deployment of robotics is going to lead to the largest job renaissance in, in, in history. And on the other side, you have social uh, computer scientists like uh, Moshi Vardy at Rice who argue no jobs at all will be left by 2045. So, you know, they both can't be right. And, uh, you know, I've, I, I've really come to a, a, a very, I mean, I'm, I put myself in the Keynesian camp. And Keynes in the 1930s wrote that technology displaces jobs, it does not displace work. And the pie gets larger. And you know, one of the things that all these guys who are writing now have to deal with is that at, right at this moment, today, there are 140 million plus people working in the United States, more than ever in history. So then you can start discussing the nature and composition of the workforce. And that's an incredibly interesting debate. And that's going on right now. But my view has actually changed from a, a conversation I had with a behavioral economist by the name of Danny Kahneman. Um, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, and I was talking to him once, and I was, I would, you know, my hair was on fire, and I was saying, you know, as robots come to China, um, they are going to displace labor, and it's going to lead to social unrest. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, you, you don't get it. And he said, if, if we're lucky in China, the robots will come just in time. And I said, excuse me? Because I just wasn't framing it that way. And he just walked me through the, the demography of modern China. And in fact, China is a rapidly aging uh, society, largely because of the one-child policy. But it's also true that Japan is aging even more quickly. Korea is aging. Europe is aging. The United States is aging dramatically. The entire world, minus Africa, is all going through this transition. And what that means in the case of China is I think there'll be a third less 19-year-olds in a decade. And then they'll have this really dramatic aging population. So you'll begin to need robots in the workforce because you won't have enough people in, in, in for the manufacturing sector that they have. And then you have this, this question of the growing um, dependency ratio, which is going in the wrong direction. And will you be able to care for an elder population, which, you know, in, in America, you know, we don't really use the extended family to care for elders the way we, we used to. You know, we put them in assisted living facilities and we park them in front of televisions. So you could actually make the case 
case that robots, if they existed, would be valuable for taking care of people. And that's so that uh, you know, for the first time in history, right now in the world, there are more people over 65 than under five. Um, by the end of, uh, by the middle of this century, by the middle of the century, there'll be double the number of people over 80 in the world alive. And by the end of the century, there'll be seven times as many people who are over 80. A very, very different world. And so, uh, what I found that the discussion about the impact of automation has not done is, is, is sort of, it's, it's been in terms of snapshots. It hasn't looked at the dynamic situation. And, you know, uh, if somebody wants to read a good, smart essay about this situation uh, today, I would commend uh, uh, an MIT labor economist, David Otter, A-U-T-O-R, who has written a book called Why Are There Still So Many Jobs? And, um, and, and actually, you know, the, the debate's evolving. Just in the last three weeks, um, my, my colleague Steve Laura has reported on two very interesting studies that I think are reframing the debate. One is from McKinsey that came out about three weeks ago. And the McKinsey people have done the same job category by job category evaluation that, um, that the guys in Oxford did two years ago where they, they had their hair on fire and they said that the, the Oxford study says 47% of all job categories are at risk of technology of automation over a two decade period. Now McKinsey's done the same kind of analysis and they, they have a very ra radically different view. They say, they say that the kind of automation that is happening is more task automation than job automation. And that means that jobs are going to change as much as they're going to be replaced. Because it turns out it's jobs by and large are, are involved people doing diverse things. And you might be able to automate part of the job, but automating all of a job is more difficult. And so McKinsey says about 5% of jobs are at risk over the next five years, which I think is a much more realistic uh, framing of it. And then even more recently, there's been a very interesting study done by a Boston University scholar, James Besson, who did the, he did a retake of the Oxford study, looked at 317 job categories, and found a, a positive correlation between the, the rate of computerization of a, a job category and the rate of employment growth. So this totally reframes things. So what that leaves us with is Otter's original, I mean, there's a group of people who've talked about polarization in the workforce, the shape of the workforce, and the, the problem of the middle dropping out, and that, that it turns out that a lot of white-collar, routinized white-collar jobs have gone away, particularly since 2008 in America. And I think that's still a live question, and that's what we should be looking at. So a long answer to, to your question, I'm sorry. But fascinating. No, absolutely, it's fascinating. And it is interesting how, in relation to even your book, like you say, just came out, that's an evolution, even from from what you were saying there, which I think is actually great. Which is which is um, it's a live question to say now. But that's the case. So so it's interesting. Even if the the jobs, you know, let's say certain jobs will go away or certain sides of jobs, this gets to the issue of essentially this series, which is what are humans good for, you know, uh, as opposed to uh, and how do you train those humans to kind of with the kind of characteristics and the skills that actually are robot proof or ones that we're going to need that machines can't take away. And, and this does kind of go into the kind of some of the things that you learn through a humanities background or you get through, through things that aren't just technical training or uh, things like that. It, 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 can you talk to a little, us a little bit about how you see that plan? Yeah. And I've been actually traveling the country having a debate with Jerry Kaplan who wrote this book called Humans Need Not Apply. And actually Jerry is very good on this. And we both basically have come to the conclusion that one of the things we say is that uh, one of the most valuable things to have in this new economy is a liberal arts education, a four-year liberal arts education. It turns out to be um, one of the things that's valuable in this new economy where you may have to retrain yourself continually over the space of your career. I mean, I am not the person to ask. I've been in the same job basically for my entire career. And that, that is increasingly not looking like the model that we're going to see. We're, gonna, we're, we're seeing a world where people do different things every two to five years. And so, uh, you know, it speaks to the kind of educational system we need, uh, but it also speaks to the ability, you know, people who are training themselves for that world need to learn how to, you know, having the ability to learn how to, to learn is one of the most valuable things. And, you know, the, the, the example that's kind of interesting to me is what, uh, there's an AI researcher who's very well known, Sebastian Thrun, who is the person who started the Google Car Project. And Sebastian is also the person who basically created the first massively open online courses. And he, he, he had this, he, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a really radical guy. And he basically was set about to blow up the entire educational system. He created a company called Udacity. And the MOOCs, it turns out, you know, they have great promise, but they, 
they are not that effective yet. You know, they have high dropout rates, and, and there are lots of issues with them. But Sebastian, after he created Udacity, actually pivoted, and he he really redesigned the company around this sort of notion of nano degrees. And he's found this niche where he's found paying corporate customers, significant numbers of paying corporate customers, who are willing to pay Udacity to essentially do these micro courses, online courses, to train people specific skills very quickly. And I, you know, that's, I don't know how that's going to play out, but that, I think it resonates with the direction where I, it's certainly in Silicon Valley, and I don't know how much Silicon Valley re reflects the entirety of the American economy, but it seems to, to be uh, the way the, the economy is moving here in the Valley. We have this notion of the gig economy, people who are continuously sort of reinventing themselves, and I mean, I don't know if I want to live in that world. Uh, I've been pretty happy working at one job that's, you know, involves doing reasonably different things all the time. Um, so I don't have the answers to the big questions, but I see these in interesting threads. Well, just just to pull out the let's so I don't even know what your background is in terms of your own your own uh, college or something, but um, would you say just thinking about that that um, that a more of a humanities-like background would prepare a brain uh, in a way that would be more suited to this than necessarily a uh, you know strict STEM kind of math and science thing, which clearly is obviously right now in terms of the job opportunities things is good. But it just it is, it is bigger picture. If you were redesigning you know higher education or something, or or saying where do we want to put resources, how would you treat the humanities? How would you think about the kinds of things you learn in that as opposed to the things you learn in that more of the sciences? Well, I'm, I'm biased because that's the background I came out of. I mean, my background is in the social sciences, actually, but I came from a liberal, a small liberal arts college where, you know, the only thing I did uh, uh, that directly uh, relate to my profession uh, when I was actually in college is I, I spent a year running my college newspaper, so that was sort of on-the-job training. But, you know, I, I had a very broad education, which included a little bit of math and science, but, but not a lot. I mean, you know... I, the reality is today uh, that uh, the, um, the the you know the, the the plastics in terms of the the workforce is data science uh, and uh, you know that that sort of pushes if you know if you want to be employable uh, right now the thing to do is to to get a machine learning data science background and it, it's startling I mean the the evidence is. Um, there's a conference that's going on this week called the uh, the Neural Information let's see, NIPS Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, which is sort of the machine learning conference. And just in the last year, the attendance has doubled. And every large corporation, uh, technology corporation, has become a sponsor, including even Apple, which is quite extraordinary because Apple sponsors nothing. But there is this white hot competition for people who have machine learning skills, and. Um, you know, I, I think that that's not going to slow down anytime soon. I can't turn around without a billion-dollar R&D laboratory being created uh, in Silicon Valley. It seems like it happens every week. Uh, and so there's this really uh, a, a remarkable demand. I was uh, interviewing Terry Jasnowski, who's one of the pioneers in the field, and his comment was that right now students are coming out of graduate school without even graduating and getting salaries that are higher than their professors. Which you know that, that that speaks to that speaks to something in terms of the economy. Um, <laughs> that said, you can certainly see ha having having both having a broad education, uh, liberal arts education, still being valuable, and then focusing on something uh, in higher education as as the career. Well, well, let's let's just shift. And actually, this might kind of relate a little bit to your other book. Um, You've had exposure over the years to Steve Jobs, and you know Steve famously. In fact, at the end of Isaacson's book on um, Steve, he talks about uh, the intersect how Jobs always thought of the intersection of technology and the humanities is kind of the intersection of where he was poised and, and where so much of the innovation was, and, and a lot of that book kind of wrapped around that those threads. Um, and his, I don't know, when you think of like how the real innovators in the valley and and, and kind of in this world are, I mean. How, Talk a little bit about how you understand their appreciation of maybe the humanities or the things that they would learn outside the, the kind of hard tech and science world. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, so you know, for me, the Valley has always been not a monolithic place. I mean, even when I wrote my my last book, my last book, um, 
what the Dormouse said. It was really about a subculture in Silicon Valley, and it, even in you know e this this was focusing on the the very it was the prehistory of Silicon Valley. There were already these microcultures, and I actually think that that's the strength of the valley is that there there are these you know there there. You, you you can literally drive down a different street in Silicon Valley. Not only is 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 it multicultural in a technology sense, but it's multicultural in an ethnic sense. I mean, drive down a, a street in San Jose, and all of a sudden the, the street signs are all in Vietnamese, or they're Chinese, or they're Indian. And uh, you know, I actually think that's what sets Silicon Valley a, a, a apart. It's an incredibly pluralistic place. Um, you know, Job's point about the intersection of technology and the humanities, um, I, th I think, it is a, f a fair one for, for, you know, the personal computer subculture in Silicon Valley, which he was a part of. Um, you know, he grew, grew up, uh, really, and this is sort of, you know, the, this, this, this culture that basically developed uh, machines to augment uh, uh, human intelligence, and that came from work that happened in the 1960s done at SRI. Jobs really sort of was the one who uh, took those ideas and took them to the to the world at large. I mean, Jobs sort of um, his his phrase, you know, the, the personal computer is a bicycle for the mind, was a perspective that I think was a very powerful way of expressing that idea of what technology could do. Um, but it's not the only culture in the valley, and uh, you know, there are some cultures that I think are very narrow. Um, you know, now the biological sciences is very much a, 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 a part of the mix, and actually, you know, biological sciences are rapidly becoming information sciences. Bioinformatics and biotechnology um, have just sort of merged right into Silicon Valley, and they are computing sciences in the real purest sense of the word. Um, and you know, against that background, you have these two world-class universities, um, Stanford and Berkeley, um, that sort of uh, you know are, are are centers of excellence where the where you know there's this you know it's an ecosystem, and uh, and the, and the, the kids cycle through and they're on their way out as you know in, in, into industry and sometimes come back. And I think it's a really healthy model uh, that has generated this sort of uh, this this ex this explosion of new industries. Well, let's talk about so. So, your book just it was the second, the first, the book before this one. What the road said. Um, you talk about the counterculture and even the kind of drug culture, and I mean things that people would think in a, in a more humanistic kind of way. Uh, how important that was to shaping the contours of, of again, I guess it's the PC industry, um, but it's at the still at the core of a lot of what's going on here. Um, can you just, I mean, I don't think that's well understood and without going into the whole thing. Just, just give people a sense of how this wasn't just a bunch of hardcore science folks focused on military, you know, applications and, you know, damn the torpedoes. It was actually this really weird stew of kind of wild thinking going on there. Uh, talk yeah, a little bit about that. The, the weird stew is the, is the right way to phrase it because I was trying to answer a question in writing that book. I was try, trying to answer why did the personal computer and the internet in, uh, arise where they did and when they did, because you could, you know, the, the, many of the same technical things were happening on the other on, on the other coast uh, around Boston. So why Silicon Valley as opposed to Boston? Boston, and I, you know, I, I'm not a, a a social scientist. I'm a journalist, and so my 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 models are impressionistic. I don't think I nailed this, but I think I had a certain insight into what was going on, and I, and, and that was. Um, it was actually the intersection of these different things that made the valley unique. Um, uh, not only was the microprocessor just available technically for the first time, but there was a uh, uh, there was this uh, there was this counterculture, a cultural you know around music and 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 drugs and alternative lifestyles, and there was a political movement. There was the Vietnam War, and so those things mix together in some interesting way and how did they come to uh, to, to lead to, to, the, to this new way of looking at computing and the best I can do, I mean actually I think this came out, out of um, uh, the uh, Santa Fe Institute, this kind of idea that argues that creativity ha happens at the edge of chaos and that was so much the way to describe what was happening at these two laboratories, uh, you know there were two laboratories in the 60s uh, right around Stanford, equidistant from Stanford, there was the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and on the other side of campus, 
there was the Augmentation Research Center at SRI, which was a military lab, but it had these sort of counterculture types hanging out. And so, I'm, you know, I've never made the argument uh, that, uh, that drugs or LSD leads to creativity, although that research was going on at the time, and I, I was stunned to see just recently it's still going on. And sort of, there is this argument that you, uh, that you get, uh, you know, creative insights out of psychedelics. And, you know, the classic example of that is Kerry Mullis, the inventor of polymerase chain reaction, which is the fundamental underlying technique of modern biotechnology. Um, you know, he, he, he his fundamental insight came when he was in a self-described acid fugue state driving to his, his cabin up on the Mendocino coast. I did not find that. Uh, to be true uh, in, in the people I looked at, but they were all involved in these cultural things, and it really, I think, you know, it sort of broke them out of these sort of straitjacket patterns that people are in. Uh, I think that's a better explanation. It's a sociological explanation. And um, it, so uh, th those, those events, I mean, the world was so different than it is now. Um, there was things happening in the street, there were things happening in the evening, these people were participating in these things while they were working on these technologies. And, you know, there was this idea of mind expansion in a psychedelic sense, and then there was this idea of mind expansion in the tools that people like Doug Engelbart and John McCarthy wanted to, to uh, design, and they resonated. Didn't you, just for the record, you mentioned Kerry Mullis, but um, didn't Jobs himself, you had, you quoted him in that book at one point. What, 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 can you re, re, tell that anecdote again about what his own thought was on that? Yeah, after Steve came back to Apple, I was one of the reporters who had access, and I would get these regular interviews with him. And it was this game where he would try to stay on message, and I would always try to get him to say something interesting. And, you know, I, at one point I got him to say that nobody was reading books anymore, and that was really quite, uh, created quite a lot of consternation. But uh, there was this moment when they had introduced iTunes for the first time, and we were sitting there talking about these machines, and somehow we got off onto uh, his earlier career, and he said, you know, very clearly that um, taking LSD had been one of the two or three most significant things in, the, in, in his life, and it set him apart. It was, it was something he'd done that his wife couldn't understand, and it was something he had experienced that the corporate people he interacted with couldn't uh, uh, understand, and it really set him apart. And I thought that was a dramatic insight into really what did set Steve apart. Fascinating. Um... Uh, well, hey, uh, now, you just mentioned there, and, and uh, we're getting towards the end of the interview here, but it, uh, a big core insight of your book, which you kind of obliquely referenced there, but I think to, the audience wouldn't have picked it up, um, is that there are two approaches to artificial intelligence design, development, that are incredibly, that, that are kind of distinct and, uh, and at some level competing. And I think for an outside audience, we'll talk about that a little bit. And, and I think in, in terms of this series, uh, the augmented kind of side is interesting as opposed to the, the pure simple AI. But explain that to folks. Yeah, and then that's the sort of almost sequel relationship between these two books because that's something I observed when I was working on the first book, that there were these two laboratories that emerged at the dawn of interactive computing in the early 60s. On one side of campus, uh, there was John McCarthy, um, the guy who coined the term artificial intelligence, created the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and in 1962, he thought that building a working AI, building a thinking machine, would take a decade. Um, you could replace the human, and at the same time, 62-63, um, Doug Engelbart was funded to essentially take similar technologies and use them to augment the human intellect. Uh, he, he was intent on building collaborative tools that would allow small groups of intellectual workers to be more effective and more powerful in what they were trying to do. And I looked at those two things and I realized there were different philosophical approaches to, com uh, to computing. And actually, uh, two other uh, uh, sort of well-known computer scientists sort of picked up on that thread later. Terry Winograd has written about that AI, IA dichotomy. And John Gruden, who's a researcher at, at uh, Microsoft, has, has explored it in depth too. And so what I realized is that that those two labs had given rise to two different and largely separate cultures within modern computing. The AI community, of course, and then what's now called the human-computer interaction community, which really rose directly out of some of the things that Engelbart did in the early 1960s, and they basically don't speak to, to each other. And so the book is basically a long uh, meditation 
uh, if you will, not an answer, but I realize that that's a dichotomy, but it's also a paradox. Because if you augment humans, um, you need fewer humans in principle. And so I was trying to understand that puzzle. And, you know, the book itself is a, a, a sense of a, a profiles of individual designers who had made choices to go from, in some cases, from AI to IA. And the most powerful example, I mean, it was just really quite extraordinary, because this is, my point is that, you know, these designers embed their values in the systems that they create. And so take Terry Winograd. Uh, who was uh, an AI wunderkind at, at MIT in the 1960s. He wrote this program called Shridlu, which was a tour de force. It was a natural language understanding program. He came out to Stanford and Xerox Park, and he worked for a decade in AI. And then he was having a, a series of conversations with two Berkeley uh, philosophers, a number of Berkeley philosophers, including John Searle and Hubert Dreyfus, who were very critical about the possibility of AI leading to thinking machines. And at a certain point, uh, Terry walked away from the AI field. He made a personal choice, and it was at the heart. It, it was. It, it happened while he was also doing. Uh, uh, he was involved in activism, uh, political activism in the early 1980s, late in terms of uh, you know the the anti-war movement. But there was a, a, a movement of uh, computer scientists called Computer Professionals uh, for Social Responsibility that had grown up in response to the uh, Reagan nuclear weapons buildup. And so he left the AI field, and he went to IA, which is a term that Engelbart coined, intelligence augmentation. And my point is that these kinds of decisions can have an impact on the world. And in Terry's case, it had a dramatic impact, because it was Terry, Proven, uh, Terry, uh, Terry Winograd who uh, essentially influenced his student, Larry Page, to work on PageRank. And PageRank, I would argue, uh, is probably the most powerful augmentation technology in history. It led to Google search um, and gave this unbelievable uh, capability to, you know, the, the entire world for free, which is really quite extraordinary. And that, that's the kind of narrative that I was, I was, I was interested in sort of drawing out. So, so one of the things we're kind of just to wrap kind of this, this interview, which has been fascinating. Um, What's emerging from this conversation, even since the book, actually, is uh, clearly the future. We got humans and robots and artificial intelligence, but that um, there's a lot of room for humans, and those humans are gonna. There, there's a lot of room for humans, human thinking, human brains, human well, creativity, all that kind of stuff. And I guess with that in mind, um, kind of the, the sense of humanism or the humanities. Uh, you know, have a relevance and importance going forward. I mean, or, 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 could you say in your own words, just you know, what good are the humanities now, and, and and are there any kind of practical ways we got to think about them of like how they really need to be at the table and in kind of the the, the, yeah. the future kind of as as it that's kind of rolling out in front of us here. Yeah, there's a very simple way of framing this, I think, and that that is this discussion that has been started by Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and. Uh, uh, a series of others about whether or not these machines are an existential to uh, existential risk to humanity, threat to humanity, um, is a profoundly human conversation in the sense that, um, while I don't think it's likely that these machines are going to be self-aware anytime soon, I think that the that the conversation they've started is a really important one because increasingly, although the machines will not be self-aware, they will be autonomous. And that means that the, the, the values that the designers have that, that go into the making of the machines becomes increasingly more important. And the, per, the person who, who's, who says this best to mind is a computer scientist, uh, to my mind, is a computer scientist named Ben Schneiderman, who is at the University of Maryland. And Schneiderman has really uh, been the best at framing, uh, he's, he's very opposed to the use of avatars, like Siri. And his, his argument about the risks is that in, in, in building these things, there's this delegation of control. You're basically, you're giving control over to the software program, and you're, you're creating a, a break between human responsibility and the machine, machine software. And so that conversation, I think, is a humanist conversation. I think it's possible to design these systems so that the human is at the center of the system and that the system has human values. And that's, that's why I'm still optimistic. I mean, the humans are still in the loop. 
at this point, and they're going to stay in the loop, and that gives us the ability to design uh, these machines in ways that actually improve humans rather than put them on the sidelines. Perfect way to end. Um, thanks so much, John. Uh, fascinating uh, discussion, and also your books are fantastic too. So we'll uh, we'll be pushing those out as well. So thanks for taking the time with us, and thanks for laying out those thoughts. Thanks for having.